Welcome back to our series on strength. Today we're going to look at uh, strength and a correlating idea that goes with it, the idea of the stronghold. And we're going to look at a very famous figure in the Old Testament in order to put those two ideas together. And of course I'm talking about David. And the, the name of this session is called David Takes the Stronghold. And um, David was an unknown and rather insignificant shepherd boy from basically the backside of nowhere, Bethlehem territory. And even though he was this unknown, insignificant, he was singled out for the Lord, by the Lord for one of the highest honors of his day, to be king in Israel. And so one has to wonder what it was that the Lord saw in David that distinguished him at such an early age. David's always an interesting person to study because he had so much anointing and personal gifting in his life. But though he did not start at a great family advantage, uh, social prestige or status, his personable charm and natural talents as a leader soon placed him and caused him to shine in positions of great responsibility and influence. And while these gifts are great and they may have facilitated him, they were not actually the reason and foundation for the incredible promotions from God that he experienced. David distinguished himself early in life. He had a passion for worshiping the Lord. He was gifted at writing music and um, singing. And even as a young shepherd, uh, used to prolonged periods of wandering alone with the sheep, he learned how to come into the presence of the Lord and how to walk continuously in uh, an awareness of the Lord's presence while he was in the wilderness. And the truth of the situation, if we were to examine it with a cold-blooded accuracy this morning, is that at the time of David, uh, there were many fine and seasoned warriors with far more illustrious bloodlines, established pedigrees than this little unknown youth. There were far more politically savvy noblemen or, inex or, or experienced cour cour courtiers, pardon me, in the retinue of Saul. And there were probably, just like Saul, a lot better looking, uh, more impressive types. Even Jonathan, uh, Saul's son and heir apparent to the throne, proved himself to be um, both a man of integrity and a fiercely bold soldier. And he was certainly a strong and worthy candidate for the throne. And yet above all of these choices, the Lord singled David out as the shepherd of his people. So we need to ask the question, why, Lord? Well, I'd like to shed a little light on that because I believe it was due to the singularity, this singularity in his life. At a very young age, he mastered the secret of strength. And the real reason that David caught the eye of the Lord was because he learned the art of mastering himself and drawing his strength continually off the Lord. And so this is the, the um, ability, this is the discipline that set him apart from every other worthy contender in the ranks of the mighty men of Israel. And this gift was trained as a boy as he was shepherding alone and he was apparently very good at learning the lesson if we can um, gather that from the fact that he managed to bring down Goliath when all the other mighty men of Israel were trembling in their boots. He was used to dealing with enemies and danger. And the fact that he did that, it set him apart in front of all Israel. This was fully refined, but he, he got that courage, he got that boldness from his time alone in the wilderness and the trials that we went through. He describes them himself, dealing with the bears, dealing with the lions. And, and later on, in fleeing from Saul, and it held him in good stead as um, it culminated in his ability to actually take Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And the secret of this strength, if you all want to do a little homework, because we can't quite fully tear apart this piece of scripture, and it's so very meaty, but if you really want to know how David 
got to be the warrior, the sweet psalmist of Israel, and the king uh, at par excellence, you need to study Psalm 18 because there is so many parts of it uh, that describe what David went through that the Lord trained him in various aspects of being a good warrior, and not just a good warrior, but a warrior king. And so it starts, let's just, um, uh, David, uh, it starts with these words, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation, my high tower. Well, that's quite a description of strength right off the top. But, it, you know, he does, he, interestingly enough, he begins his preamble of the description of God's position as warrior and protector in his life, as captain of the hosts, by saying, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And um, that is a very powerful and, and interesting juxtaposition of ideas there, and what, two that don't usually go together. I adore you, Lord, because you're my champion. And uh, David's journey, which we see in Psalm 18, was a, about learning about not only the strengths of his life and his personality and character, but the strengths of the Lord and how to live his life in the Lord's strength, not just his own. And so he has a lot to say all through his songs and um, the other scriptures about his many encounters with Jehovah Savayot, the Lord God of hosts, the Lord God of armies, and uh, the epitome of strength. And so Psalm 18 is a testimony of David and a very masterful summation of all of his exploits he experienced, learning that the Lord was his stronghold in all the changing seasons of his life. And so it provides us with great insights about the unfolding levels of teaching and discipline that he went through that finally took him up and promoted him into kingly levels. And so I would just encourage you to have a look at Psalm 18 because it talks about the Lord girding him and arming him with strength, making his way perfect, setting his feet like hind's feet on the high places, teaching his hands to war, his fingers to fight, his arms to break a bow of bronze, um, the, the shield of his salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. All of these kinds of warfare uh, training and activity are all found in that psalm. And uh, we don't have time, as I said, to really take that apart. So I'll leave it with you as homework because we're going to jump into the story of how um, when David understood that the Lord was his strength, he also became his stronghold. And it's a great thing to recognize the areas in which God has blessed us with strength in our own lives. And we love to walk with him in the spirit and see these places developed within us into full maturity. It's a beautiful thing. But it's even more powerful to let the Lord take you into the valleys, the valley of your own weakness and insecurity and vulnerability, and teach you that in those seasons, how to live off his strength, how to let him be your stronghold, your refuge, the place you run to, the thing you trust in. It's far more important by far to allow the Lord to humble us and show us he is our stronghold. And in those places, he reveals um, himself in the different offices of his name, and all those names together uh, constitute God is our stronghold. Because the scripture says this, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. That's a perfect description of stronghold. And so if we're looking at a, a technical uh, worldly definition of stronghold, it's actually used as a fortified place or a fortress, a place of survival, refuge, 
um, an area dominated or occupied by a special group or distinguished by a special quali uh, quantity, quality. And um, Jean Brooks also has done an excellent teach teaching, if you want to Google that, on strongholds and strategies. And he describes um, a stronghold as um, obvi if taken from 1 Corinthians 10.4, they're not demons or actual geographical locations, but, but psychic habitats, a head nest that Satan and his cohorts endeavor to manipulate our inner world or our mind. And um, what it is precisely sort of looking at is the calculated reasonings we do in our mind over time, uh, as opposed to random occasional thoughts and they can turn into religious or philosophical systems. And that's just a, a brief uh, introduction by someone who's done a lot of uh, study on it. His name is Gene Brooks, Strongholds and Strategies. You might want to have a look at that. But they are entrenched ways of thinking that come into our minds and into our spirits and create an enemy outpost where Satan can bombard us with lies and, and he can dominate a, a place of our thinking and behavior with his own kingdom rather than with the kingdom of God. So that's what we call a stronghold and that's what we're going to look at today. And it is also used in scripture, if uh, metaphorically, as places, things that are in our life or um, our mind, our ego, that are based on human confidence or pride or achievement, opposed to those places that where we rely on God and his wisdom. They are walls or fortresses that are built around our belief system and our emotions we, the, to protect us from further pain or trauma. So if we want to begin to identify where the strongholds in our lives are, we can ask some questions. Number one, where do you return to when you feel threatened or afraid, exhausted or perplexed? That will constitute a very strong um, revealing of where strongholds are in your life. And um, the Lord would love to build strongholds of peace, uh, shalom, covenant faithfulness within us. But we can run to many different sources uh, other than that, other than his kingdom or himself. And scripture states emphatically that there is only one true stronghold against all the terrors that life can throw at us. And it's the stronghold of the Lord, the truth of God's kingdom, the life and work of Jesus, and his resident presence within us through the Holy Spirit now as New Testament believers. It's the stronghold of the Lord himself. And Paul puts it this way in Corinthians. He says, we have the mind of Christ. We, and he calls for, in Romans 12, a renewed mind, a transformed mind. And what that is talking about is the Lord's coming into our thinking, into our believing, into our emotions, and dissolving the places where Satan has made his habitation. And he's been feeding us lies to kill, steal, and destroy. And so when the fear of the Lord rules us and we come back into this awe and love and majesty, the presence of the Lord, all other giants fall and all other strongholds dissolve because the fear of the Lord drives out all other fears and redeems them. And the strong always understand that they're going to, you know, there's seasons to war, but then there's seasons to rest and seasons of re recuperation, seasons of weakness. And in those seasons, we they return, soldiers return to the garrison. They return to the stronghold. And so we all are going to need to do that at some point. And just to uh, look at a few examples of what might be a stronghold to stir up your thinking, some of us have a very um, powerful stronghold in our life, a family identity. Uh, we're very 
rooted to our community. It, it, we don't do anything without running it by our nuclear family. Uh, and, you know, there's such a thing as, as apron strings. It's good to be in covenant relationship with your family. But then I'm talking about places where the opinion of your family is overriding the opinion of God and the way of his kingdom. That might include cultural backgrounds. Well, we just do things this way because I'm, I'm from a Germanic background. So it's like that gives me some kind of excuse for being uh, stubborn and obstinate and refractory and refusing to give up my old man, my dead old man, because, well, that's how Germans are. You see what I'm illustrating by a cultural background. Maybe your stronghold is your education. Maybe you've been taught and raised to believe that unless you get a solid education, you can never succeed in the world. Um, that education is the be-all, end-all. The more numbers of, of letters you have behind your name, the better you will do in life. That can be an actual stronghold, an idol, a thing you worship. Or maybe you're bound up in this sense of um, ego or pride or accomplishments or the status of your life. You're, there's a drive in you um, that it becomes your stronghold. Well, I've achieved all this. Look at how, how high I've gone in my profession, how much I've done. Again, how much education I have behind me. And when you can retreat to that place when you feel threatened, um, it's the place of your stronghold. Maybe if you're, especially if you're a woman, marriage can be a very uh, large stronghold. We're very defined by the husband we've married or the number of children that we have or the uh, so social associations, the level of status in the community we enjoy because of our marriage. We feel, and, and we give it too much priority. We, we give it to our husband and our family and our children some places that belong to God. And our family becomes our stronghold. Maybe money is your stronghold. And uh, Psalm 49 talks about the folly of those who believe that money uh, is their stronghold. It's, it says flat out, death is their shepherd. And uh, But people, uh, money makes them feel safe. The more money they have, they feel secure again and insulated against the dangers of life. But of course, we know that's true because the scripture says money ain't going to help you in the day of trouble. It might help you a little, but there's a lot of things in life money cannot help you with. Or maybe a stronghold in your life um, is centering around a defining or traumatic event. People who've been in major car crashes and are paraplegic and it, it uh, they go into a decline, into a depression of which they can never come out of because they believe they are defined by that trauma. Maybe you were uh, abused as a child or abandoned as a child. And these things make such a large psychic mark within you that the enemy just can make a really big encampment and influence uh, the thinking over all the rest of your life. That, my friends, is the definition of a stronghold. But the Lord is always ready, willing, and able to be our stronghold. And uh, there's many places that describe this. And sometimes the stronghold is just identified by the word Zion. That's the stronghold uh, of when we are trusting God. It, and it's a poetical and metaphorical name. It's not just a geographical location. Just because you live in Jerusalem doesn't mean God is actually your, the stronghold of your life. It's talking about the place, the high, where God is the high place of your life. And it's described in Isaiah 26 verses 1 to 5. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keeps her troth may enter in. You will keep her in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts. I'm going to say she because I'm reading it. Trusts in thee. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And that's talking in poetical terms about what it means to make God your stronghold. Um. So many, many forces, as I've just illustrated, are vying 
for this attention, this power, this worship in our lives. They may be fleshly, worldly, or demonic, but they're trying to gain supremacy over you, over your mind, over the patterns of your thinking, over the power that you possess in your life. They want to control it and commandeer it. And they, they do that through trying to establish a stronghold. And any, this, of course, is anything that exalts itself against the name and lordship of Jesus and tries to bring you into bondage to itself instead. Because Christ is the high tower of our faith and our stronghold. He's our fortress. And um, now we understand that there's a war over the mind, uh, over the thinking. Uh, in Ephesians, we have an enemy, specifically a principality and power, described whose job it is to do that. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And that doesn't mean he's just flying around. It means he's in that uh, second heaven realm trying to control the minds and the flow of destinies, nations, and individuals. And so 2 Corinthians 10 warns us about this warfare, verses 4 to 6. It says, we do not, though we live in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty before God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So this is really the description. We are warned that there's a war going on in the mind. And the spirit-filled person is going to be aware when Satan is trying to implant these thoughts, these desires, and stir us up in testing and temptation and negative emotions. And it tells us what to do to cast down imaginations and bring into captivity every thought right straight to Jesus. And when this happens, we begin to get mastery in the spirit realm. We become veteran warriors. And it's just the ability by accessing the power of Christ within us, because our spirits join to his spirit, that we begin to see the entire realm of our existence, internal and external, being transformed when Christ is a stronghold. And so the Lord Jesus died. He, he was crucified, he was tortured, and he died to liberate you from the power of every single one of these strongholds, these tyrant masters who are trying to gain control of your life and divert you away from fulfilling God's destiny for you. Strongholds are very powerful, very real spiritual realities, and they need to be taken extremely seriously. The Lord states clearly in many places in Scripture, He alone is God. He alone created you. He alone has the right to demand allegiance from you, although He does not demand it. He asks for your free will and your free love. He is your original and authentic stronghold. Your life, your very existence, every source of your strength flows from Him. Though sin and our fallen nature through it, we've lost this pure and, and intense revelation that we once had of this reality of all our life flowing out of God. And so we need to be sanctified. We need to have our minds renewed and cleansed and filled with redeemed patterns of thinking. And that is the entire work of the Holy Spirit. But he does it through scripture, the written word and his presence, the living word. So let's just jump back into our study of David. We looked at uh, some personal statements from him, but now let's look at some actual warfare situations in which the Lord shows himself very much to be um, flowing out his strength out of the stronghold of God. And I want to look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 8. 1 Samuel 30, chapters 1 to 8. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, attacked Ziglag, and burned it with fire. 
and had taken captive the women and those who were there, from the small to the great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of the people was grieved every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, bring me the ephod. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him, saying, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So this is a, the story of when David and his men were actually living outside of Israel in Philistine territory. And the king of uh, Philistine ha- had given David Ziglag. And so he and his men were sort of encamped there. It was their garrison. But while they were gone, they had gone to fight um, the Philistine with the Philistines against Israel. Remember this story? And when they got there, The rest of the Philistine captains took one look at David and said, he cannot go with us because he might betray us and fight with Israel. So they sent David and his men home. And in the meantime, uh, in the time when David had gone and his men had gone and come back, Ziglag had been attacked by the Amalekites and leveled. And so the lesson of the stronghold that we learn from from David here is a very good one. David was a warrior who had not only learned how to garner his strength for, for the battle, but he also was able to recognize when he was in the place of his weakness. He knew what to do when he was battle fatigued, discouraged, or just plain out of his league. And this story shows us that it says he strengthened himself in the Lord. His men were about to kill him. I mean, even his men were about to kill him. But he withdrew into that secret place with the Lord, and he strengthened himself, probably picked up his guitar, and started worshiping. and just got himself into the zone so that he could prophetically get a word from the Lord. And he learned the strategic retreat that the presence of the Lord was his stronghold. He knew how to admit when he was confronted with an enemy stronger than himself. And everyone, no matter how mighty, how successful, how full of prowess, experience, or talent, at some point, you're going to grow weary. Even the tempered veteran warrior or the very young virile buck, at some point, is going to need to rest, sleep, eat, and refuel. It's then they must return to the stronghold. And so this is one of the lessons we take away from the great chronicles of David. All of your strength will flow out of your stronghold. So you better know what is your stronghold. And um, David was tested many times and proved himself many times. Remember the story of Abigail and Nabal? He was... uh, tested under the old fence of great provocation. He was tempted to take his own revenge. But the Lord sent him Abigail, and he didn't uh, take vengeance in anger that he would later regret. Uh, He was deeply uh, troubled many times by Saul's pursuit of him. When he was anointed king, the, the anointing itself actually brought the trouble and the offense from the powers that be, and they chased David all over the wilderness. And when he had no home, when he had no camp, when he had no garrison, when he had no place, he had the stronghold of the Lord. David was tested many times upon this. And remember when um, in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6, David uh, attempted to bring the ark 
back into Jerusalem, and he failed. Why? Because he was using a Philistine method to handle <laughs> handle the God of Israel, and it didn't work. And so in front of all Israel, David failed, and there was a great offense um, that took place in his heart. It took him two years or three to get over it, and the ark stayed in the house of Obed-Edom, remember? And, and lastly, he, there was the huge offense in 2 Samuel chapter 7 of not being allowed to build the temple. After he'd done all the work, been chased all uh, hell and high water all over the place, and finally was settled in Jerusalem, the Lord wouldn't allow him to build the temple for various reasons that he discussed. But uh, I believe it, the Lord wanted Solomon to build it as an act of dedication to join his heart to the Lord. But David was tested with offense and trial and temptation many, many times. But he learned the secret of returning to his stronghold. And that was the presence of the Lord. And so finally, I want to look at the story of how if God is your stronghold, you can take the stronghold of the enemy. And again, it's a David story. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. 2 Samuel 5, um, David is going to take Jerusalem by divine strategy. Um, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David very insolently, saying, You shall not come in here. The blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, those blind and lame who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the Milo and inward. And David went on and became great, and the Lord of hosts was with him. So after a long season of David being forced to scramble around Israel and hide from the jealousy and wrath of Saul, it, it would seem that um, there was no more pathetic moment of weakness in his life than that time of everyone hating him and betraying him. And yet, even in this very dark period uh, in his life, God even redeemed that for the benefit of the kingdom. Because what happened is, it gave David a vast experience of the terrain of Israel, for one thing, and the terrain of the uh, Philistine, the nature of the people of the land, and the strongholds uh, or the garrisons in each little pocket of land that he and his men inhabited for a season, he really became a spy over the whole land. And through all this swanning around, um, David was shown by the Holy Spirit the prime location to unite all the factional tribes of Israel into a united nation under one king in the center of the land, which was Jerusalem. Jerusalem occupied this prime location at the center of Israel because it was the concourse of major trade and travel routes. It was about equidistant for all the tribes to flow to as they came up for the great feasts and religious festivals prescribed yearly by the law. And David perceived that it was the perfect place to bring all the partisan and opinionated tribes together under one banner. However, there were difficulties. Jerusalem at that time was controlled by a group of Canaanites called the Jebusites. They were a powerful and immovable faction that were so secure in, this, in the natural defenses of their land and the garrison fortress of Jerusalem that they were not afraid to fling these highly insulting and provocative statements at David, a, a fierce warrior and an anointed king. So David was faced, as he looked at Jerusalem, he had a twofold problem. Number one, how are you going to take Jerusalem? And number two, how are you going to take Jerusalem without shedding blood? 
because the book of Leviticus says that when that bloodshed defiles the land. So how can you bring the, temperna uh, the tabernacle and the ark into Jerusalem if you've defiled the land with bloodshed in taking the city? So he had some serious problems because it was his intention not only to unite the tribes into a nation, but to establish Jerusalem as the center of worship. So um, he's faced with this nearly impossible task of taking the city in a peaceful coup. So what does he do? He waits upon the Lord. He worships. He enters the stronghold. And he is gratified. He receives a revelation from the Holy Spirit about how to do it, go up the water courses. And so he did. And it states clearly that not only did David take the city, but he took the stronghold the stronghold of Jabus, and it was the fortified citadel in the very heart of the of protected enclave, probably in the palace area, or uh, also these kinds of citadels were the, the treasuries or the munition depots of the city. And so he took the stronghold of the enemy and claimed it as his own. And not only that, it was so spiritual, so anointed a victory, that to this very day, if you say anywhere in the world, the city of David, people will know you're talking about Jerusalem. That's how powerful that victory was that day. And so this is the kind of thing that if we want strength God's way, we need to seriously consider this idea, this problem, if you will, of the stronghold. Because the Lord wants us to have the stronghold of Zion within us. And several Psalms, Psalms 87, this one was born here. The Lord himself, the highest, will establish him. This is the kind of thing that is spoken. There's all kinds of promises that are given when the Lord is the stronghold of our life. And we are able to release and relinquish other things that we've been hanging on to for our security. We return to true strength. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we look to you today to show us and begin to reveal in our spirits, Lord, where we've been trusting other things above you. Places the enemy has built a nest, a garrison, and is perverting our thinking, is draining our strength off of us, and is just warping our image and our view of ourself and our identity. Lord, I pray for a redeemed mind. I ask you, Jesus, to give us your mind and to dissolve the works of the evil one in the places where he's become entrenched in our lives. And we want to return to this strong, strong city. Open the gates, Lord, and let us in because of the blood of Jesus. In your mighty name, amen.